You know, the planet has been a pretty fun place as of late. Apart from the issues, the illness, and a general sense of doom, it's been an interesting couple of years to say the least. Really, the only thing we are short of at this point in Apocalypse Bingo is an asteroid impacting the planet or an alien invasion. But what form of invasion would that take exactly? Would it be a War of the World scenario where a germ takes out all the aliens? Or maybe aliens germinating with humans, like in the movie Alien? Well, in today's episode, it's none of that. On the planet Mars, despite us having been fascinated with this celestial body since we first noticed the red dot in the sky, Guy, humanity has been shown to be very wrong about the existence of life there. For 800 centuries, a species of large brain creatures would thrive on the radiation blasted planet and set out to confront their lesser solar system cousins, humanity. Of course, this confrontation may have actually just been an accident, but upon realizing that Homo sapiens really had no actual way to combat the Martians, the whole generalized thinking towards Earthlings shifted. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about something I've wanted to discuss for a long time, the aliens from Mars attacks. And for all you saying, but Roanoke, what if they bring breathe nitrogen. Well, I got an entire thing set out for that, so it's gonna be good. So as for everyone watching, uh, just so you guys know, we do have game night on my Discord at Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. For all that are interested, links in the description. Come and hear me rage in the microphone about why the other player is clearly hacking in Battletoads. It's always a blast. All right, so we all know the generalized nonsense that I'm about to say, so up on screen you'll see a timestamp for the anatomy and physiology of the Martians. Hopefully they'll do a better job than the assumptions made by the scientists in the actual movie. But if you want to get to the science, then head there. For all others, let's talk about about why when you come to Earth, you may as well accelerate something to the mass of a human up to like 95% the speed of light to take us all out at once. Because humanity is a lot like a cockroach. It's really hard to take us all out. And if you turn on the light in the kitchen at 3 a.m., we scatter and run into things. So we open up our story four miles outside of Lockjaw, Kentucky. Quite the name. As a man heads outside, he sees something in the distance. Well, it's a bunch of cows on fire for some reason. I guess you could say, uh, that's pretty rare. In the background, a saucer leaves Earth and immediately heads back for the red planet. Arriving there, silo doors open up from underneath the surface as more ships are released, all heading towards Earth. Also, if Mars was this close, that would be massively alarming as every volcano on the planet would erupt at once due to gravitational forces imparted onto the surface. But apart from that, the entire fleet has arrived and then encircles Earth. Heading to Washington, D.C., the U.S. government is well aware of these things surrounding the planet. And here's the most naive thinking. The president asks basically the Secretary Jerry, the dude in the gray suit, his take on this. He says that people are going to love it. Yes, because people are not panicky and ridiculous when confronted with the unknown. Not at all. That'd be crazy talk. The general, however, has another idea. Move to DEFCON 4 and keep it top secret. Ah, that sounds like the American government we know and love. The professor in the room mentions that they are technologically advanced, which suggests they are peaceful. So, a quick side note, uh, no it does not. An example of this would be the conquistadors with the Aztecs. While the Aztecs did have their own technology, the generalized vibe of interacting with cultures is whoever is more advanced typically trounces the one less advanced. Now, that's a very human trait, but as a species to obtain technology, they need to be greedy some with resources, which means they need resources from other animals and those concerning their own species. Which then means, just because they are advanced, in no way suggests that they are enlightened and peaceful. And that's why I believe we really need to shut up concerning broadcasting our position in this galaxy currently. And the first opportunity we have, reclaim Voyager, as that thing is giving our exact freaking coordinates on it. But anyways, that's just a Roanoke conspiracy theory. Anywho, heading to Vegas, we see a whole bunch of nonsense, you know, Vegas, and this is where we meet Byron. His ex-wife is calling him about their sons, nothing important, just that they are getting back together. And we now meet Jack Nicholson again, and he is playing two characters at the same time, and this one's known as Art Land, just a sleazy dude being a businessman. Also, his hippie wife, Barbara Land, she talks about how he's destroying the Earth, but then he just gives her some, like, chips to go play with and everything's all good. If only it were that easy. Back in New York City, a station is going live in 10 minutes, and they need to cut in before meeting Marty McFarlane fly in an alternate universe. He's looking at his hair, remarking how great his hair looks. By the way, there's a ton of characters in this movie, and it feels like a lot of them serve no purpose apart from, like, small subplots. But if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it's definitely worth a watch. Or maybe you just watch this summary. You can do whichever, honestly, I'm not a cop. So Natalie calls Jason to tell him that the president is cutting into her show today. The president has stated that they are going to be interrupting everyone. He goes on to say that the Hubble Space Telescope has captured aliens that have arrived outside of their atmosphere. And as you can see, everyone stops to listen, and then we get the usual message about Martians to which everyone is enthralled with. The next morning, as Jason threatens a chihuahua with a fork, Natalie gets a call to do an interview. Jason asks her who that was and what it was about, and she responds that they want her to do an interview with specifically the professor guy from the White House. Why on this show and not a major news network? Well, probably because major news networks are complete trash. Everyone knows the real reliable news is from the guy with the tinfoil hat outside of Burger King. So in a mobile home out in the desert, we see a small family. Jack Black is putting together a force multiplier blindfolded, his actual name is Billy, and he's heading to the 
military soon. The family talks about kicking the Martian's butt. Hopefully that won't come back to bite them. And as Louise fulfills her job of driving a bus, she ends up running into her two sons playing a game in the arcade. They're trying to tell her that class was canceled that day, but she's not having it. She throws them on the bus as everyone claps because sometimes you just need to watch the law get laid down. But now we get to see how sleazy Jerry is as he picks up some women off the street. And we call this foreshadowing. Back in Vegas, and I know it's jumping all over, but eventually it will slow down. Byron is talking about a raise. He gets shut down immediately. Oof. But we are now heading to an interview. We get some information on why Professor chose Natalie's show. He watches it all the time and is apparently quite enamored with her. So even though the alien's coming down and information is needed to get out, it all comes down to just something else, doesn't it? Doesn't matter because as they talk, we get the same nonsense about how we can assume they are peaceful. <laughs> No. But anyways, Donald suggests that the life developed under the surface of the planet and that we have seen nothing on the face of the planet, which is true. But as they talk, the camera feed cuts and we get a look at the aliens and they're pretty ugly. One might say even butt ugly, but ugly Martians. And there's your massively obscure reference for this video. Having their brains exposed, large eyes and a barking language, it motions something on the screen, which is the international symbols for donuts, according to Richie. Okay, so here we have the like hilarious portion of the movie. Professor Farnsworth over here has already surmised the Martian anatomy from a small hijacked broadcast. I mean, intestines, heart size, blood vessel structure. I have no idea how he put this all together as no autopsies have been performed, but hey, doesn't matter. So here we see they're just like us in a few ways, carbon-based life forms, but they breathe nitrogen, which no way they breathe nitrogen because how in the fresh hell did they breathe on Mars originally? Now there is a theory that Mars was once quite habitable back in the day, but nitrogen being an inert gas accompanied with what it is now just seems a little strange to me, but we will discuss that later. But the large cerebrum indicates telepathic potential and he bases this on absolutely nothing. As another doctor rolls out a device, they've already decoded the entire language. The recording mentions about something with half-breeds, now conspiracy, but I think that what it's talking about is humanity as a whole, descending from Martians, and that we are the half-breeds. Then it mentions harvesting. It sounds like a threat, but it's never really answered when the general asks what that means, but that's just my interpretation. Back out in the desert, Billy is boarding a bus to begin his military career. I'm guessing that he hasn't started yet, but he does have dog tags, so I don't really know what's up with that. Anyways, Richie is then tasked with taking grandma back to the home. As he does that, Jerry is giving a press conference where they aren't 100% sure if they will allow the press to be there to meet the Martians. For the love of God, keep the journalists away. Over in Vegas, Byron is out for a run. As he goes down like the center of the road, Art pulls up. So he looks back at him like he's the weirdo for being in the road. Anyways, Art offers Byron a deal to fight again and have Art bet on him. At this point, the Martians then send coordinates to the US government. The general wants to have tanks there. The professor does not. So they agree to not bring in like the whole military Military, but they do need to send someone to meet them as a show of peace. So out in the peacemaking area, we see Billy is setting up barricades, very distinguished in the eyes of his family. General Casey arrives in order to meet the Martians, and Barbara is in the distance being a giant hippie. They did, unfortunately, let the press in the area with the aliens. Very good. As General Casey looks around, eventually a saucer descends out of the sky and lands in front of everyone. As the ship opens up, we get the Martian ambassador come down from the ship along with his entourage. Standing smaller in stature to humans, General Casey mimics the symbol that the Martians gave prior. The scientist translator finally begins working as the Martians greet them. So basically the generalized exchange of pleasantries and then they say they come in peace. A hippie lets out a dove which alarms the ambassador as it blows it out of the sky before reducing the general to a skeleton. Well, the first contact was completely botched as they open up on everyone. The military and the press start getting got. Billy runs to pick up a force multiplier and take out the aliens but it ends up jamming and he instead grabs the flag to say that we surrender but then gets annihilated on TV in front of his parents. <laughs> Jason then crawls over to Nat and as she pulls his hand, we see that he has gotten got as well. The Martians then begin abducting things like the bird, the dog, and Natalie. As the president discusses what to do, the general wants to just straight up nuke them. Jerry wants to set up a town hall. That's not going to do anything. And the professor says that they need an open line of communication as a misunderstanding concerning cultures likely just happened as the ambassador reacted poorly to seeing a bird. And Marsha just wants the president to give crap out of them. The president instead decides to talk to them directly and translate his words. Broadcasting to the Martians, he says that there must have been a misunderstanding understanding between them that they can try again and meet at a more secure location. He also ends with them saying that they have nothing to fear from humanity. One of the aliens picks up the broadcast and then brings it to Superior, to which they both laugh at it, so that's probably good. Always a great time when aliens are laughing at your peace proposal. Recovering a body from battle, the professor and a few other scientists are performing an autopsy. They discover that the brain on the outside is actually formed on top of the skull, and the interior appears to have a lot of green blood, or maybe even some goo, although it may have just been like straight up 
liquefied by what hit it. But we will get more into that when we talk about the anatomy later. However, if the brain is structured like this, that is fairly strange to have the brain exposed on the outside, the skull on the inside, and maybe a more interior brain within that skull. Meanwhile, in the Martian ships, they are conducting their own experiments. They have taken Natalie's body and attached the dog head to it while keeping her head alive in a tank. As the professor sits there later that night, they receive a message from the Martians. The Martians issued a formal apology, and they say they feel terrible and that they will meet in the congressional building in the US of A. A no bird sign has been put up to stop any miscommunications, and the aliens then enter Congress and begin talking to all of Congress. As he begins to talk, he reads off the message from Earth, then straight up pulls out a gat and starts annihilating all of the members there. Look, I'm not saying that he may have been doing Earth a favor or anything, but uh, you know, Congress. After that, they nope out of there as they have crippled a large portion of the American government at this point. Flashing over to the war room, the general wants to use nukes on everything, but the president is still quite reluctant to do so. The president wants the American public to know that they still have two out of the three branches of government working for them, which ain't bad. So everything's going to be okay. The president addresses the public, but looks rather nervous doing so. Oh, also, the professor was abducted earlier, and then he also has had his head removed from his body. He hits on Natalie while suspended, and again, it all comes down to one thing, doesn't it? And speaking of that one thing, that's what almost dooms the executive branch. Jerry pulls up on a woman who looks exceedingly strange, and then invites her back to the White House during an alien threat, and says that he will give her a personalized tour. Jerry pulls her into a back room, or the Kennedy room, and he jumps on a bed, which looks really hard, the bed does, and then he gets her to come over. He sits down next to her, and then they start making out. He then puts his finger in her mouth, I think to pull out the gum, and she bites it off before smacking him in the head. And now she's officially loose in the White House. Finding the president and his wife, she approaches to take them out. Removing the mask, the alien has been sent in to take them both down. The dog barks, alerting them, which then he takes the dog out, which is sad. He then basically just grabs the president before getting startled by a bird. This gives the Secret Service a chance to dome the alien. This angers the Martian ambassador as they now go into a full attack mode to begin the invasion of Earth. They also got an analysis on the gum, which will later turn out to be nitrogen dioxide, which will be important later. So here's what's like really weird. As the White House is besieged by aliens after they literally just went after the president, they're back to conducting business as usual like the next day, which doesn't seem like a good idea. What we do see though is that force multipliers do in fact work on the aliens as a few begin getting domed. During the ensuing fight, Marsha is crushed by a chandelier, which we see Byron Sons pick up the energy distributors and start annihilating the aliens left, right, and center from their time playing video games. And just like that, we're back in Vegas. Art gets got inside of his own building and you gotta kinda wonder what the point of his character arc was, but that doesn't matter because as Byron calls back to his ex-wife, Barbara approaches Byron and asks if he could fly a plane that belonged to Art. They're trying to get out of there. Also, if you don't know, Danny DeVito is in this movie. Byron punches an alien, knocking it out, or maybe just ending it and taking its energy distributor. Vegas is now under full attack along with the rest of the outlying towns. Back in DC, the President of the United States gets a phone call from the President of France saying that the Martian ambassador has said that they will make a peace agreement, to which not. Nah, they just straight up do the same thing to the President of France too. You think the US would have like warned the planet by now, but finally the general convinces the President to deploy their nuclear capabilities. The missile is launched containing the nuke up into space to hit the ship. As it does, this thing is let out that then absorbs the blast entirely. Returning to the ship, the ambassador smokes it and then laughs. So Earth is getting straight shrek by now with monuments getting destroyed. Mount Rushmore, for instance, is changed into the alien's face. Anything human built is knocked down. You know, real enlightened moves. Out at the trailer park, Richie tells his parents that he's going to get Grandma from the home, seeing as there's a full-scale invasion happening. As he leaves, a Martian mech shows up and starts grabbing trailers and destroying them and the people inside, and then turns and begins giving chase to Richie. In Vegas, Danny decides to go his own way, but then gets annihilated by one of the aliens. Bummer. But then that alien gets destroyed by Barbara, who was literally just half a second too late. In the home, Grandma is listening to her music with a headset on while Richie leads the mech into the power lines, which ends the alien piloting it. As Richie runs into the home, he finds the aliens are lining up a ridiculously close shot on Grandma for some reason. So then he yells to her, and somehow she hears him, not really sure how, but this causes her to turn around and her headphones to become unplugged. This changes the music to the speakers, and as yodeling commences, much like with me, the aliens start writhing in pain. I guess we are so different after all. Their brains begin to contract and quiver as clearly they are in, like, agony, and then their heads explode one by one. Back in the war room, the door bursts open as a ball is thrown in. Everyone assumes it to be something really bad, like a concussive force distributor, but the ambassador comes in right on its tail, laughing at them. The general is the first to confront them. Apparently, the handhelds no longer work for some reason. Plot armor. The ambassador shrinks him down and then steps on him, taking the general out. At this point, everyone in the room pretty much gets manhandled until they get to just the president. He then launches into a monologue about how they could work together rather than fighting. And at first, it looks like the ambassador is agreeing with what he's saying. He puts out his hand to shake the president's, but 
it was a trick. The arm crawls out before stabbing him in the back and then planting the Martian flag. They do the Martian symbol for donuts and then walk out of the room. Richie, however, is faring much better than the military. Driving down the road, blasting the yodeling, the aliens start dropping like flies. Getting to the radio station, he puts on the same music to broadcast it all over and up into space, where they know that the aliens are listening to human broadcasts. Back in Vegas, the group has reached the airfield to get out of there. As Byron and Cindy go to open the door for the plane, Byron says he will draw the aliens away. He goes out there and squares up with the whole group and gives the international symbol for fighting hand to hand. I guess actually that would be an uh, interplanetary symbol. He immediately beasts the living hell out of one of them before getting jumped by all the others. As the group takes off and looks down, Byron is lying down, seemingly having got got. But did he? Out in Washington, it becomes apparent quickly that the aliens cannot deal with the yodeling music as they all begin to drop the second they hear it. Ships in space begin crashing all over as their pilots have had their heads explode. The professor and Natalie share a kiss before their ship ultimately crashes into the water and they meet their end as well. The next day, as the man who sings It's Not Unusual will be loved by anyone, along with Barbara and Cindy, exit the cave. Why they ended up there, I'm not actually sure. It appears that what's left of humanity has won. Although honestly, the world governments are done, so who's really keeping anyone in check anymore? Nobody really knows. Richie gives a speech after receiving a medal for saving the world, and he wants everyone to live in teepees rather than houses for some reason. And we get back to Louise and her boys. She assumes Byron didn't make it out there, to which we see him step on the head of a fallen Martian like an absolute Chad and then go back to his family. All's well that ends well, you know, except for the millions, perhaps billions of lost souls. So I believe the first place we should start and where we should really kick this whole thing off is the overall morphology discussion and how their planet shaped them into being what they are, because believe it or not, where you live is rather important to your physiology due to environmental stressors. Getting a good look at the Martian, we can see there are several similarities and differences from Homo sapiens. Across the board, they are shorter than both male and female humans. Standing at what appears to be just about five feet or 1.5 meters tall, most humans on the latter half of puberty would likely be taller than a Martian. You're probably wondering what I base this on. Well, Martians do not appear to really tower over anyone, or even another, in general. Height doesn't really seem to be too diverse amongst their population. As the ambassador meets up with the president, the president stands at about 5 feet 10 inches or 1.78 meters. The Martian is just at about shoulder height with the president and based on the average human head, being roughly 8 to 9 inches in height, we will say 9 for the president. This means that the Martian would be about 5 feet tall, maybe 5 feet 1. The Martians are bipedal in nature, having many of the same physiological traits as a human would with the upright posture and head that is supported by a spine rather than by muscle and proportionate limbs for walking, being longer as opposed to the grasping limbs being shorter, which is their arms. So before getting into the background of this species to how they got this way, let's first cover the generalized morphology for a moment. Starting with the feet, we see that they actually have a lot in common with our own. Believe it or not, they do in fact have five toes with a plantigrade structuring much like humanity does, which we are going to get way deeper into the conspiracy theories later about humans and these creatures. Moving up to the legs, we can see that the similarities between these creatures and our own structuring is quite evident. Possessing calf muscles and knees, much like our own bodies, there is almost nothing to report of them being different from the fact that they hail from another planet. Getting to the pelvic region, you may not want to think about it, but considering what they wear, they may also have a very similar setup to what humans have. In fact, when the ambassador was from earlier checking out a Playboy magazine, he seemed to uh, get inspired for a moment before deciding to change out the head of Natalie with the dog. The abdominal area of the body is incredibly sucked in, however. In fact, overall, they sport very little body body fat and instead muscle and bone appears to be just below the surface. Now this could be for a multitude of reasons such as, well, Mars is pretty barren, food production may have been somewhat of an issue for the species, although with the level of technology they have they could really just conquer planets to create farms and grow what they need at this point. Moving up to the torso, we see they are a bit more fairly muscular having pectoral and deltoids on display quite readily with again very little fat to cover it up. Moving down the arms, they are quite slender but the hands are where things are rather interesting. Their hands are set up the exact same way as ours, having four fingers and one thumb per hand. This says something about Mars, but also says something about our species as well. Then getting to the head of this creature, we see the most prominent features of them. They have a much more skeletal looking face, but a lot of the same structuring as humans. The jaws are comparable areas concerning connections. The teeth are completely exposed, but structure would suggest that they are omnivores, much like us as well. The nose is completely lost through evolutionary processes, and instead a hole sits in the center of the face. We never see the creatures blink, like at all, suggesting that there are no eyelids, but a giant pair of eyes sit facing forward, and this suggests that these creatures are predators on Mars, much like what we would find on Earth. Then getting to the brain of this creature, it's rather interesting. It would appear that the brain exists somewhat on the skull of this creature. It would be easy to miss, but during the autopsy, we see that the brain matter is in one area and just beneath it, there is a ledge before the professor puts his hand in the creature's brain and then pulls out the green goo. This may suggest that the brain on the outside grew as an adaptation as the skull had reached its maximum potential for outward growth without deforming the other connections like with the mandible. So with this incident, 
intellect increasing and the skull at its limit, the brain appears to have literally just exited the skull and grown over it. Now, you would think skin would be important to cover this, but it is possible that there is somewhat of an unseen membrane covering the area on the outside of the skull. It can also be assumed that inside of the skull, the brain still exists in the same capacity as well. It's just the cerebrum has been increased. On the other places concerning the face, this creature also appears to have a flap of skin that's kind of just flanking either side of the mandible as well. Well, I'm not 100% certain why this would be there, but because it does exist, it appears to serve no purpose. This may be to designate the sex of the creature, which moving on to that, it's fairly strange. Within this species, unless they're all just a one sex raiding party, we do not see any sexual dimorphism displayed amongst the Martians. However, these jowls possibly could be an indicator of this. It's also possible it may just be an age thing, sort of like skin drooping with humans as we age. All right, so at this point, it's time to shed some light on Mars because A, it's fascinating, two, it may become a planet that is incredibly important for humanity at some point, and D, I've used this joke before. Mars, first and foremost, is a bare and dry red planet, as you have guessed. But the sad thing is, it may not have always been this way. A long time ago, actually roughly about 4 billion years ago, for roughly around 800 million years or so, it is hypothesized that Mars had water all over its surface. It created massive streams and rivers, and this was all thanks to the denser atmosphere, which in turn led to higher temperatures across the planet. Mars lies just outside the range around the sun known as the Goldilocks zone. This zone is something Earth falls in, and in fact, Earth is actually maybe even a little too close to the sun, which means Earth could have been a better place and actually could be even better now for humans if we could just move it out just a little bit. Or if we find another Earth-like planet more situated in the Goldilocks zone, it might just be like 73 degrees all the time. Anyhow, Mars exists just outside of the zone, making it colder. But eventually, it will enter the zone again as the sun expands and gets hotter. Unfortunately for Mars, at a certain point, everything went sideways for the planet. It is hypothesized that unlike Earth with its metallic spinning core creating a magnetosphere, Mars does not have the same setup. Because of this, it lacks a magnetosphere, which opens it up for radiation from the sun that is typically blocked on Earth. Over time, between the constant flow of charged particles from the sun, solar storms beating the atmosphere, and its weaker gravity, the atmosphere was almost completely stripped away, causing the water to dry up, and if anything existed on the surface at this time, to meet its demise. Kind of blows to think about, actually, because Venus and Mars are both at this point believed to have been habitable for humanity at some point in time. Probably would have helped out space exploration just a bit if we had something more than just Earth. It almost feels like, as a species, we're like waking up late at the sleepover. It's like everybody already woke up and had breakfast and we were sleeping an extra two hours. Anyways, I digress. Once this happened, Mars was rendered barren and devoid of the possibility for life to exist on the surface. But this is not to say that the planet has no water. Within the craters, under the surface, and at the poles still exists a fair amount of accessible H2O. Humanity will likely have to use when we establish any Mars-based colonies, and that's if we don't blow ourselves up like a bunch of idiots down here prior. But the view of Mars, having once been habitable, may have led to the Martians that we see attacking Earth. This could also explain their physical biology as well as possibly their metabolic requirements that were mentioned a few times throughout the movies. The first thing is, hands like the ones we've seen in both the Martian and humans don't just develop by chance. Grasping limbs evolve as such for what you would imagine, grasping branches and trees. Because of this, we can assume this race is a very old one based on our current understanding of what Mars may have been. Hailing back over 4 billion years ago, this would give them enough time to advance their tech. But not only that, they were likely the original species to arise first on their planet and outclass the others due to the short time window for Mars to be largely habitable and inspire these evolutionary changes as seen with Martians. So basically, they didn't have dinosaurs get wiped out and then they restarted. They were the dinosaurs. But even by that metric, I guess insects were really first. But then ocean life was first. They were the ocean life. But this also gave them enough time to form these traits. It would appear that much like on Earth, the Martians first climbed amongst the trees and then stood upright. This may have happened because while their planet was drying up, forests would have likely been replaced by savanna grasslands like we see with our own ancestors. Which the running theory is now, humans came down from the trees and then stood upright to see over the high grass. With this in mind, as the Martians stood upright, this allowed for their brains to become larger as a skeleton supported the brain case instead of muscle. With their upright posture, it would appear that they would have followed a lot of the same evolutionary pathways as humanity did. Turning to hunting, any animals on their planet would be fair game, which led to the forward-facing eyes, and on top of that, the omnivore status based on their teeth would imply that vegetation was also a part of their diet, which means vegetation had to exist on their planet in the first place. Basically, there's a lot of context clues to support that Mars was habitable based on this movie. Over time, however, as their planet became less and less habitable, their technology is ultimately what would save them. Perhaps they didn't quite have the tech scale to sort of restart the core of their planet or create a planet-wide magnetosphere, so they went with the cheaper option, live underground. There are actually several benefits to this, 
like not being blasted with radiation day in and day out by the nuclear fusion blob in the sky. And this would have appeared to have affected their physiology greatly as well as their metabolisms. Upon their descent under the surface, we see in a lot of ways their bodies aren't equipped to deal with the surface outright anymore. And no eyelids, their eyes would likely dry out unless there exists some adaptations such as transparent skin to protect them. It also is possible that the skin on their brains is actually just almost completely see-through as there was really no point in having pigment as there was no sun to contend with. We do get to one adaptation that is pretty interesting however. The iris of the Martians does not absorb light or reflect it like what human eyes have to contend with. The pigment is dealing with an entirely different landscape with different wavelengths of light so instead in their case their irises have turned red. In humans this would be because the blood vessels are visible such as with albinism but considering the Martian blood is green this would say that the pigment is actively reducing red light coming in by reflecting it out. And seeing as they hail from the red planet this would be very important as red light in your eyes all the time not going to be great for your retinas. So now we need to talk about the internal anatomy and metabolism because there are a few things the professor said in the movie that ended up counteracting what he said initially which was probably intentional but stop writing on my parade. So the first thing to note about their bodies is that again they are very slender. Mars has only roughly about 38% of the surface gravity of Earth. Because of this muscle mass would not really be such a strong requirement nor would stronger bones. In fact the idea that Martians could even effectively move on our planet without some form of gravity well within their suit is just not possible. They would crumple under their own weight as their bodies were never designed to contend with the higher gravity and stressors. Couple this with the fact that their balancing system is likely located within their skulls like ours, they would be thrown out of whack dealing with Earth's gravity. This has led however to them having a more slender and smaller appearance as they never needed to be large to deal with the issues like on Earth. The atmosphere of Mars also played a large role in their evolution quite like ours did. Starting with the single cell life form that first formed on Mars long ago, back in Mars history, despite being outside the Goldilocks zones, meaning that it was colder, Mars actually had a thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide, so the planet remained warmer. However, any plants that were there likely did not undergo photosynthesis like it would on Earth. Instead, they likely underwent a form of respiration to create CO2 with the release of energy. They may have also taken in CO2 to form glucose, but it's hard to tell concerning potential plant life. The Martians, however, appear to have an entirely different form of metabolism from what we would call not normal on Earth. Now, I get this question a lot. Rono, how do you know an animal that comes to Earth from somewhere else won't just breathe nitrogen? We have a ton of it. Well, you are correct. And it might sound strange, but the reality is nitrogen is an inert gas. You're correct about there being a lot of nitrogen. Because of this, it just doesn't react well with other gases or even at all, meaning that if you want to get energy out of it, you are better served just squeezing a rock. It's almost like a physics question at this point. Animals just cannot use something so inert to extract energy from. There are other elements that could replace oxygen in terms of energy production, such as hydrogen or sulfur, and other species' biometabolisms on other planets may be based on such. But nitrogen just cannot be used in that capacity to power something like an animal. So then the question is, well, if the Martians are able to breathe nitrogen, what are they really doing with it? Well, you may have noticed, to those that listen carefully to movies, there's always context clues as to what's happening, well, if it's a good movie anyways. After that one Martian sneaks into the White House, he is seen chewing gum because he does not have a helmet on. After he gets domed, they analyze the gum and find that it's actually highly concentrated nitrogen dioxide. So chemically, that's NO2. For reference, animals breathe out carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and we breathe in O2, which is oxygen. Plants take in CO2, break it apart to create glucose by commandeering the carbon from CO2, and then release O2 for animal respiration, and this cycle continues and everyone benefits. Now, with this in mind, if the Martians are native breathers of nitrogen dioxide, I would propose they're simply using an enzyme within their body that is able to separate the nitrogen from the dioxide to allow them to breathe in O2, which I can also hear you. Okay, then why not just breathe in the O2 from Earth if they need O2 for their metabolism? Well, let's take a look at that. If separating components of the air sounds strange to you, it's really not. It's just all based on metabolism. For instance, there is a bacteria on Earth currently that actually absorbs nitrous oxide. It then denitrifies it using the nitrous oxide reductase enzyme. It breaks it down into N2 and water along with two cytochrome Cs. The point of me telling you that is it is entirely possible for cells to take in nitrogen mixed with other gases, break them down, and utilize them in different areas, much like what we see plants doing with CO2, or humans doing by attaching carbon to O2. So what I see happening concerning the Martian metabolism is that they are naturally 
NO2 breathers. We have found evidence of nitrogen in the Martian soil, which may hint that it is actually more plentiful in the ancient atmosphere. This ancient gas may have been their air of choice once upon a time, and CO2 was more likened to, say, nitrogen in our atmosphere. It's not viable, even though it made up the majority of the atmosphere. The Martians having this nitrogen reductase would be able to separate the nitrogen from the double oxygen, allowing them to have a similar metabolism to humanity, but this would not mean it's a one-to-one. -one. There is likely something about that enzyme that should the molecule of air not fit properly, then it just won't be used. O2 drifting into the lungs of the aliens would not be processed as viable for the metabolism, leading to an alien to suffocate. The nitrogen in NO2 would act as an identifier to the body that this is what's supposed to be used for energy production. This falls in line with why humans can breathe in O2, but ozone, which is O3, is an irritant to our respiratory tissue, or how CO2 will literally suffocate us despite O2 being a part of the molecule. Another clue as to them accepting nitrogen is the color of their actual blood. In humans, we have hemoglobin to help oxygen bind with the help of iron, and this gives us the red blood coloring. However, there is something known as sulfihemoglobin in humans, and this turns our blood green and causes issues with oxygen binding properly. In humans, this is bad. However, the Martians, this may literally be their pathway. Sulfur has the ability to bind with nitrogen. So if my hypothesis holds up, then in humans, where O2 binds to iron and then is ferried around the body for a metabolism, sulfur binds with nitrogen in the Martians to ferry the NO2 around the body, which also accounts for the green blood that we see. But on top of that, that would mean that if they just walked around Earth, the sulfur could not properly bind with the O2 in our atmosphere, meaning that they would suffocate. So back to Mars, it's also possible that they detected their atmosphere dwindling over time, and not only would they capture what they could and then funnel it to the underground living areas, but this would also deplete the atmosphere to the point of what it is today, leaving the surface quite barren due to how thin it had become. And this metabolism is interesting for another reason entirely, actually. Because now it's time to move on to the Roanoke Conspiracy Theory, which this movie came out in 1996, so it's probably already been said and verified, but I haven't seen it yet, so I'm gonna say it anyways. I don't care that you broke your The Martians, at first, sent a message to Earth saying that they have been watching for 800 centuries, which quick maths, but that comes out to roughly 80,000 years. Humanity, to our knowledge, has been around in its current state as far back as 80,000 to 100,000 years ago. We aren't entirely sure, but we know it's kind of within that time range. So the reference here is that the aliens are saying they have been watching us from the beginning or have been around from the beginning. They go on to say that we are all also half-breeds. The question is, half-breeds of what? Well, the cat's out of the bag with that one, as the statement I just made pretty much confirms everything, but I believe half-breeds are with them. The Martians have been around for a very long time and have had their technology grow on Mars. It appears that by choice, they just didn't leave Mars, or maybe they did spread outside of the solar system, but Earth was never really looked at as a good prospect, which if you are breathing NO2 and CO2, acting as a medium in that atmosphere, Earth with its nitrogen and oxygen-based atmosphere is quite inhospitable. And considering they couldn't save their own planet, they may not have just possessed the technology to do so. I believe an exploratory mission was conducted on Earth 80,000 years previous, and while they were there, the aliens ran across a form of creature that made them recognize it as similar to their own being. I mean, hey, we all do silly things in the heat of passion, Jimbo. I would say that judging by the ambassador looking at a playboy and feeling something for another planet species, them referencing humanity as a whole as half-breeds, and the undeniable similarities between humanity and the Martians, it's pretty clear that someone somewhere hooked up with a Homo erectus. Now, maybe not the early version of erectus, but the one that had less hair that would eventually evolve into Homo sapiens. Now, this may have been less of a hooking up scenario and more of just like a gene splicing type of deal, but again, the ambassador looking at the playboy kind of looked pretty interested. Now, this may have been done for several reasons. The first is to try to create a hybrid that would look like the Martians, but could breathe the atmosphere of Earth. They could establish a link with Earth with a people like themselves who were capable of Earth and also still interbreed, thus growing their empire. However, it likely became apparent that what they created was not so much like themselves, but also different from Homo erectus. The creatures that would have larger brains, the same faces and face shape, and stood completely upright with less hair, would not be as intelligent or presumed as not as intelligent. And this is why the aliens would come down at first, kind of wondering how things were going and who was stronger. But realizing their creations were not as equipped mentally, they opted for annihilation of them to maybe try again with another species on Earth. And this would likely explain everything concerning the Martians' own evolutionary history, as well as our own, with the mention of half-breeds and harvesting. The grasping limbs, our own five fingers and toes, are striking similarities between the two species with humans looking, obviously looking more like a primate, and in general, why the Martians appear to have regarded humanity as a failed experiment, laughing at our technology and desire for peace. The general was right. We should have nuked them from the start, because after all, the Dark Forest answer to the Fermi Paradox states that civilizations that strike first have the advantage, and the ones that stay 
stay quiet, survive. And if you haven't seen that episode of Kurgazakt yet, I would highly recommend it.